Welcome back to our course, Critical Learnings on Forest and Adivasi Rights. It is well known that scheduled areas, which are the homelands of the Adivasi and tribal populations of India, are also where the most dense reserves of minerals are to be found. Given the rapidly growing demand for such minerals in the Indian economy, extraction of minerals in such areas has increased steadily in recent years. In this episode, we will examine the basics of mining law in India. We will also explore how this area of law intersects with the architecture of laws which protect Adivasi rights, such as PESA, FRA, land acquisition, environmental laws, and so on. Let's begin with the basics of mining law. It is commonly understood that the minerals below the earth are owned by the state and not by the owner of the land. But it's important to unpack this legal statement. Article 294 of the Constitution of India provided for the succession of all property and assets belonging to the colonial British government to the Indian state. Thus, all property, assets, rights, liabilities and obligations which vested in the colonial government before independence are vested in the central or state government as the case may be. At the time of independence, all the state governments enacted laws abolishing zamindari and other such intermediary systems and all such estates were vested in the concerned state government. In Orissa, for example, the Orissa Estates Abolition Act of 1951 vests all zamindari property including communal lands, wastelands, forests, mines and minerals, whether discovered or undiscovered, in the state government absolutely and free from all encumbrances. The government is not a private property owner of these resources. In keeping with the representative constitutional democratic form of government we have established through the constitution, all these lands, minerals, resources and powers are held by the state governments in public trust. Therefore, the preamble of the Orissa Estates Abolition Act refers to the directive principles of state policy in the constitution and in particular to the responsibility of the state to ensure economic justice for all. Similar laws were enacted in different states across India, some examples of which you can find in the supplementary notes for this lecture. It is these laws, together with the provisions of the constitution, that establish the ownership of state governments over mineral deposits within their geographical jurisdictions. When it comes to regulation and development of mines and minerals, however, the power is shared between the central government and the state governments. This is provided in the constitution itself. In entry 54 of list 1 and entry 23 of list 2 of the 7th schedule. The first charge under entry 54 list 1 is of the central government, whose extent of control over regulation and development of mines and minerals is established by parliament through statute in the public interest. Thereafter, under entry 23 list 2, the state governments have control over the remaining mines and minerals, that is, the area of control of the state governments is subject to or subordinate to the control which has been established by parliament in the central government. This law, which carries forward the mandate of the constitution and establishes the primary control of the central government over mining, is the Mines and Minerals Development and Regulation Act 1957 or MMDRA. You can see in the slide how the language of the long title of the MMDRA and of section 2 mirror the language of the constitutional provisions. Since the control of the central government is through the MMDRA, parliament can increase or decrease, expand or contract the extent of such control through amendments to this act. Let's try to understand this in a simple way. Where ownership of minerals and mines is concerned, that is vested in the state government concerned. Where regulation of mines and minerals is concerned, the extent of power and control is fixed by the MMDRA in the central government and the remainder of the power and control rests with the state government. Finally, since the extent of control of the centre is determined by law, the control can be increased or decreased by parliament by amending the law. 
that is the MMDRA. This is best reflected in the distinction between major minerals and minor minerals. Minor minerals come under the jurisdiction of the state government and section 15 states that it will be the state government which will control grant of mining leases for minor minerals. But what are minor minerals? Minor minerals are defined in section 2E as building stones, gravel, clay, sand and any other mineral which the central government notifies as a minor mineral. So we find that the power to determine what is a minor mineral also lies with the central government. There is no definition of major minerals in law, but only minerals or specified minerals which are included in the first schedule of the MMDRA. State legislatures have enacted laws such as the Orissa Minor Minerals Concession Rules on how minor minerals are to be regulated. This delicate dance of power between the central and state governments is the subject matter of numerous central and state legislations, circulars and executive instructions, and also hundreds of judgments of the Supreme Court and various high courts. Mining law is indeed a formidable specialization in the legal field. The MMDRA provides the detailed procedure for application and grant of mining leases, where the decision-making authority is distributed between the central and state governments. In a landmark judgment titled State of Tamil Nadu vs. Hindstone, the Supreme Court of India held that the provisions of the MMDRA are meant to regulate and develop mining to ensure that minerals which constitute a nation's wealth are not to be frittered away and exhausted by any one generation. One way of ensuring that mineral resources are not squandered for this generation and the next is to ensure just and fair land acquisition procedures. Article 31A of the Constitution restricts the power of eminent domain of the state by requiring that acquisition of property or rights in property must be adequately compensated. Article 21 of the Constitution, read with Article 300A, requires that no person can be deprived of their property or livelihood except in accordance with the procedure established by law. Indian constitutional courts are quite clear that this procedure cannot be just any old procedure. It has to be just and reasonable, that is, the basic requirements of due process must be satisfied. Let us also not forget that any acquisition of land by the state must be in the public interest, which means that it must satisfy the basic requirements of the directive principles of state policy, including Articles 38 and 39 on distributive justice. The dreaded Colonial Land Acquisition Act of 1894 has been replaced with the LARR of 2013. That's the right to fair compensation and transparency in land acquisition, rehabilitation and resettlement act. The LARR has brought in several safeguards against state misuse, such as the broader definition of affected persons to include people with access rights and the need to obtain consent of the landowners when acquiring land for private projects, the mandatory social impact assessment before land acquisition proceeds, and so on. The LARR also has specific provisions to protect the rights of Adivasis and forest dwellers. Section 2 requires that acquisitions in scheduled areas must conform to the local laws restricting transfer of tribal land. Section 41 mandates that prior consent of the Grand Sabha must be obtained in scheduled areas and lays down stringent conditions for the resettlement exercise. Section 42 also states that community rights under FRA must be specifically acquired and compensated. The second schedule gives detailed requirements for resettlement of affected families who are primarily dependent on land. Unfortunately, the LARR itself excludes its own application to acquisitions under several special legislations, such as the National Highways Act, the Railways Act, and the Coal Bearing Areas Acquisition and Development Act. In September 2015, an order was issued by the central government extending the provisions relating to compensation to all these legislations. The procedural protections, however, are limited to acquisitions made under the LARR alone. So the question arises, 
what are the protections available to adivasis and forest dwellers when mining projects are undertaken in their lands and the state decides to bypass the LARR? What are the spaces available to adivasis to protect themselves against forcible and unfair displacement? To answer these questions, we must look once more at the several laws we have been examining in the present course. This includes the PESA Act, FRA, environmental laws and also the MMDRA itself. First off, let us look at scheduled areas. As we have seen in the lecture relating to PESA, where minor minerals are concerned, the prior recommendation of the Gram Sabha is mandated by law before any mining lease can be issued or any auction conducted. Some states have incorporated this requirement in their state rules, such as Rule 4.6 of the Orissa Minor Minerals Concession Rules. But what about major minerals? While PESA does not specifically require Gram Sabha consent before grant of major mineral leases, it is useful here to invoke Section 4 of PESA makes the Gram Sabha responsible for safeguarding community resources and also mandates consultation with the Gram Sabha before land acquisition for any developmental activity. Unfortunately, the authorities often neglect to follow these mandates when making acquisitions under the legislations exempted from LARR, such as the Coal Bearing Areas Acquisition and Development Act. In such a scenario, whether it is a scheduled area or a non-scheduled area, we can rely upon various environmental laws and also on the Forest Rights Act. You may find it useful to refer to the lectures on the use of environmental laws in FRA which are part of this course. But let me summarize these for you. As far as the FRA is concerned, there are several inbuilt provisions to protect Adivasis and forest dwellers from unlawful displacement. Section 4.5 prohibits dispossession from forest rights until the rights recognition process is absolutely complete. Section 5 empowers the Gram Sabha of forest dwellers to protect its traditional forests and the forest ecosystem, including wildlife, flora and fauna, water sources and cultural heritage. These provisions have been reinforced by rules and circulars issued by the MOAF and MOTA and also affirmed by the Supreme Court in the Niamgiri case. It is now well established that Gram Sabha consent is a necessary prerequisite before any forest can be diverted for any non-forest purpose. Environmental laws also provide space for local communities impacted by mining. All mining projects, whether for a major mineral or a minor mineral, must obtain several different kinds of environmental permissions. One such is the environmental clearance from the Central Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change or MOEF. These clearances come with detailed conditions and it's useful to obtain copies from the website or through RTI, examine the conditions imposed and then confirm whether these conditions are being adhered to or violated. This process is called ground truthing. The local community can complain against any mismatch between the conditions in the various environmental permissions and the reality. There's one other provision of the MMDRA which I must point out. In 2015, a new Section 9B was introduced, which requires that in every mining affected district, a District Mineral Foundation Trust or DMF must be set up. Every mining lease holder must pay a certain proportion of the royalty into this fund to be used for the benefit of the people in the mining affected area. Interestingly, the power to make rules for the DMF has been vested in the state governments on the condition that these rules must be guided by Article 244, the 5th Schedule, the 6th Schedule to the Constitution and also by PESA and FRA. So Rule 12 of the Orissa DMF rules, for example, states that the Gram Sabha's approval is required for all works undertaken in its area and for identification of beneficiaries. At the end of the year, the trust must also present a report to the Gram Sabha. The reality is far from this ideal. According to data released by the Ministry of Mines, in December 2021, the total amount collected under DMF across India stood at above Rs 57,000 crores, out of which less than half, 
or 28,000 crores had been spent. And spent how? Many state governments have been diverting DMF funds to the state consolidated fund and other state level schemes, which is a violation of the law. If you reside in a mining affected area, it would be useful to find out what is the status of the DMF fund in your district and how it is being spent. Finally, it's important to remind ourselves that Section 31G of the SCSD Prevention of Atrocities Act makes it a criminal offence to dispossess an Adivasi or Dalit forest dweller from their forest rights or prevent them from enjoying such forest right. It is true that invoking the criminal justice system is an uphill task for marginalised communities. But even the existence of such a provision in the statute books is an important morale booster for Adivasis and forest dwellers, especially for those who take on the daunting task of insisting that mining enterprises, large and small, adhere to the law of the land. In the end, we must remember that while the law relating to mining is complex and often obscure, the foundational principles of the constitution are quite clear. Adivasis and forest dwellers must participate in an informed manner in decision-making processes relating to the mining of precious minerals from their lands. We have seen that spaces for such participation exist under the Land Acquisition Law, the PESA Act, Environmental Law, Forest Diversion Law and State Mineral Laws. It is up to us together to fully engage with these legal spaces and ensure that these constitutional aspirations become a reality. Thank you for watching.